Buck lived at a big house in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley. Judge Miller's place, it was called. The house was approached by gravel driveways, which wound about through wide-spreading lawns and under the interlacing boughs of tall poplars. And over this great domain, Buck ruled. Here he was born, and here he had lived the four years of his life. Good afternoon, Manuel. Yeah. Buck didn't read the newspapers or he would have known the trouble was brewing, not alone for himself, but for every Tidewater dog strong of muscle and with warm long hair from Puget Sound to San Diego, because men groping in the Arctic darkness had found a yellow metal, and because steamship and transportation companies were booming the find, thousands of men were rushing into the Northland. These men wanted dogs, and the dogs they wanted were heavy dogs, with strong muscles by which to toil, and furry coats to protect them from the frost. Buck accepted the rope with quiet dignity. He had learned to trust in men he knew, and to give them credit for a wisdom that outreached his own. But when the rope was placed in the stranger's hands... days and nights he neither ate nor drank, and in those two days of torment he accumulated a fund of wrath that boded ill for whoever first fell foul of him. It'll be fine. You'll be a bad dog, and I'll wail the stuff out of you. Buck was beaten, but he was not broken. He saw that he stood no chance against a man with a club. That club was a revelation. It was his introduction to the reign of primitive law. Ah, this is the one you need. A big strapping brute named Buck. <laughs> He's big enough, all right. Why isn't he eating? Ah, he's sulking. Got a temper for a big dog. Had to show him his place. This is my best dog, Perot. He'll pull your mail sled all the way to Dawson by himself. Mark my word. Three hundred. Three hundred? It's my price. He's worth more. It's a lot of money. He's a lot of dog. I'll give you three hundred for him. And for that frisky one over there. Curly. The next morning, Buck and Curly were loaded onto the narwhal. The vessel sailed north from Seattle, quickly crossing the Canadian border. The journey continued, pressing on through Queen Charlotte Sound, past Juneau, into Lynn Canal, and finally, up towards Dye Beach. At last, one morning, the propeller was quiet. Buck knew the change was at hand. This is Buck. <laughs> and Curly. Take them over to the camp. I'll go get the mail. Get out! 
Here, Billy. Here, Buck. Spitz. There you go, Dave. And Curly. That was fair, Buck decided. This was a new kind of man. A man too wise in the way of dogs to be fooled by dogs. As a courier for the Canadian government, bearing important dispatches, Perot was anxious to secure the best dogs, and he was particularly gladdened by the possession of Buck. There you go, sir. Thanks a lot. Hello, John. How are you this morning? Fine, Perot. And you? All right. I have plenty of mayor for Dawson this time. Oh, I see. What's the weather like in a trail these days? Oh, well, it's pretty bad. Especially around Lake Bennett. Yeah? down, that was the end of you. Well, Buck would see to it that he never went down. Spitz looked at Curly unmoved, and at that moment Buck hated him with a bitter and deathless hatred.
Was war? Das ist Samex. What's the problem? Well, he's old and half blind. He knows how to pull a sled. That's all I care about. Fancy colors for you, my friend. Come on back. Come on back. Good time, yeah. Let's get moving, Francois. Or we'll never make it through the canyon. Though Buck's dignity was sorely hurt by being harnessed like a horse, he was too wise to rebel. He buckled down with a will and did his best, though it was all new and strange. He was glad to be gone. He was surprised at the eagerness which animated the whole team and which was communicated to him. The toil in the traces seemed the supreme expression of their being and all that they lived for and the only thing in which they took delight. There you go, Dave. Here, Spitz. Come on, Buck. Thieves. What happened? One of them stole my bacon. Where'd you leave it? Doesn't matter where I left it. They had no business stealing it. No, Buck wouldn't have stolen it. it was you, wasn't it? If I ever catch you, you'll wish you'd never been born. This first theft marked Buck as fit to survive in the hostile Northland environment. It marked his adaptability, his capacity to adjust himself to changing conditions, the lack of which would have meant swift and terrible death. It was all well enough in the Southland under the law of love and fellowship to respect private property and personal feelings. But in the Northland, under the law of club and fang, whoso took such things into account was a fool and insofar as he observed them, he would fail to prosper. Come on, Buck. You build yourself a nest, go back to it. Hey, hey! All right, hold it, Buck, hold it. Get out of there, Spitz, go! Go! The next day they made 40 miles, the trail being packed. But the next day, and for many days to follow, they broke their own trail, worked harder and made poorer time. It was a hard day's run, up canyon, through snowdrifts hundreds of feet deep, and over the great Chilkoot Divide, 
which stands between the ocean and the Yukon River and guards forbiddingly the sad and lonely north. We camp here. All right. You're gonna like this. Trust me. Hurry up. The weather's getting worse. Come on, come walk. Come, come on, Buck. Don't worry, you'll get used to them. That's it, Buck. Come on. That's it, Buck. <laughs> you'll get used to it. I've seen it all, mon François. Boots for a damn dog. <laughs> the ice. Pretty bad. Could lose half a day. So keep your wits about you. Here, in Dawson, were other Southland dogs. And every night, regularly, at nine, at twelve, at three, they lifted a nocturnal song, a weird and eerie chant in which it was Buck's delight to join.
Seven days from the time they pulled into Dawson, they dropped down to the Yukon Trail. Perot was carrying dispatches more urgent than those he had brought in. Also, the pride had gripped him, and he proposed to make the record trip of the year. The week's rest had recuperated the dogs and put them in thorough trim. Good days are on, Francois. Salmon. <laughs> Little rabbit might taste good, eh? <laughs> and you too. Hear them. Leave them be. It's nice to have some quiet over here. Spitz. Mercy was a thing reserved for gentler climbs. Instincts long dead became alive again in Buck. The domesticated generations were falling from him. Looks like he put up a hell of a fight. Damn it. It's tough enough on the trail. Now oh, this. I'm glad it's finally over. You're glad we lost the dog? Buck's worth two dogs. We're gonna make better time. 
No more spits. No more trouble. Hope you're right. Come on, Alex. Come on. Got a new job for you. Come on, Alex. Back. Go away. So, you think you should take Spitz's place, eh? Go away. Go. Solex will lead. Stay. I've had enough. By God, Buck, I'm gonna teach you your place. I say give Buck a chance. He fought for it. All right, Mr. Perrault. Maybe you're right. It was a hard trip with the trail behind them, and the heavy work wore them down. Since the beginning of winter, they had traveled 1,800 miles, dragging sleds the whole weary distance. Buck stood it, keeping his mates up to their work and maintaining discipline, though he too was very tired. Monsieur Perrault. No broken bones. Put him back in the traces. No, he's too weak to pull. Then you know what we have to do. He might recover. We'll make him run behind. Come on. All right. Let's get going. You can do it. Wait!
I'll do it. Pull the dogs ahead. Rush! Rush! Buck knew, and every dog knew, what had taken place behind that belt of river trees. And they knew that this thing was very close to them. Thirty days from the time it left Dawson, the male, with Buck and his mates at the fore, arrived back in a wretched state, worn out and worn down. Die, thank God. Sounds like you're both lucky to be alive. Too bad you're gonna have to go back to Dawson. What? Urgent mail for the Northwest Police. No way we can make it to Dawson right now. The dogs are exhausted. They need a week to, to rest up. Sorry, you're the only messengers in town. Cyrus O'Neill's got some fresh dogs you can buy. Yeah, now what am I going to do with my dogs? Sell them. Dye's crawling with southerners, half of them looking for dogs. Three fifty. Hmm? Four hundred. Is that right? Yes, here's Evans. Hmm. And give the dogs a good rest. They need it. Hmm. Where are the dogs? In this way. Goodbye, my friends. You're a good dog, Buck. Au revoir, mon ami. Buck listened to his new masters apprehensively as they proceeded to load the sled. There was a great deal of effort about their manner, but no business-like method. No, that one should go on top, please. All right. Yes, dear. Hey. Hey. Okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't tote that tent along if I were you. <laughs> Undreamed of. How in the world would we manage without a tent? It's almost spring. You can get along with that. <sighs> Thanks for the advice, mister. I think it'll rhyme. And why not? Well, it seems a mite Tom heavy, that's all. Oh. Ah, well then. All right, listen up, you mutts. I'm your new master. And I demand obedience. Stand. Stand, I said. I, I said stand up. Oh, you lazy brute. No, Hal, no, you mustn't. No, no, you mustn't be so harsh with them, or I won't move a step. You have to whip the dogs if you want anything out of them. Ask any one of those men. Whip. They're weak as water, friend. They just got off the trail. They need a rest. But just look at them. Well, it's the, it's the big one here. He's he's lazy. What's his name? Uh, Buck. Okay, Buck. Up. You're crazy, mister. Don't you talk to my brother in that tone of voice, sir? Now you do what you think is necessary. Why don't you get up and see what you get? What a good boy. Back away, Mercedes. I need to get going. Yes. Oh, 
I just have to take a few things off. Warm it up? Feeling better? No. How can I feel better leaving all my things behind? Oh, but sweet Pete, with all the gold we're going to find, I'll buy you every new dress in Dawson City. Uh, everyone just relax. With seven dogs, we're really gonna fly. This is a lot harder than you told me, Charles. Well, you didn't think getting rich would be easy, did you, dear? <laughs> all right. All aboard the Gold Express. Is it? <clears throat> Ready? Yes. All right, you mangy mutts. Mush! Uh. Mush! What? Uh, what now? Well, perhaps I should walk for a while. All right, here we go. Mush! Mush on! Here we go. Hurrah for the Klondike! <laughs> This is spring. I'm glad we missed winter. Eat hardly, lads. You've earned it. But how? We didn't get very far today. It's not bad for a first day, especially considering Cleopatra sat on the barge the entire way. A woman can only walk so far in one day. Now, sweetheart, don't be like that. Perhaps we should show her the map. She's your wife. What's wrong? Oh, we got a problem. See, I thought we had passed Lake Bennett yesterday. No, no, that was that was Lake Caris. Oh, you poor doggies, you look so tired. Well, what if we went this way? We could meet up with the White Pass Trail here. We cut our distance by a third. But but in Dai, they said that trail was dangerous this time of year. No, dear, don't do that. You mustn't overfeed the dogs. Oh, no, no. Don't be so cruel, Charles. They need their sustenance. But we'll run out of food halfway to Dawson. No, we're taking the White Pass Trail, and we're cutting the dogs' rations. Buck felt vaguely that there was no depending upon these two men and the woman. He didn't know how to do anything. And as the days went by, it became apparent that they couldn't learn. This way. Come on. Let's go. This way. Why aren't you wearing your snowshoes? They're back there. Why don't you go back there and find them if they're so precious? Charles, would you please inform my sister that this is not Milwaukee? That this is, in fact, the middle of the damn Yukon? Why don't you tell my foul-mouthed brother that I am trying my best, but I just can't walk anymore. I just can't. 
By this time, all the amenities and gentlenesses of the Southland fell away from the three people. Shorn of its glamour and romance, Arctic travel became to them a reality too harsh for them. Ha! A shot! Through it all, Buck staggered along at the head of the team as in a nightmare. Stop! Whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa. What? Look! Oh, Lord. How are we going to get across? Just don't panic. We'll just... We'll follow the river upstream till it's frozen. Come on, let's go! Keep moving! Yeah, mush! Yeah, mush! What does he want? I think he's trying to tell you something, dear. He wants you off the sled. But I'm freezing. Get off! Or we're not going anywhere. I didn't want to come on this trip, you know. I didn't want to look for gold. I only came because I wanted to be near you because I love you. And now, everything is ruined. It was spring, but neither dogs nor humans were aware of it. From every hill came the trickle of running water. All things were thawing. The Yukon was straining to break loose the ice that bound it down. Thin sections of ice fell through bodily into the river, and amid all this throbbing of awakening life, through the rushing of the swollen river, like wayfarers to death, the two men, the woman, and the dogs staggered into John Thornton's camp at the mouth of White River. Thank God. We're traveling upstream, looking for some ice to cross. Well, there's lots of ice, but it's about to break. I wouldn't call it safe. We made it this far. We'll find a way across. Could be. You look frozen stiff. No. We... We're just fine. Up. Up. Come on, Buck. Let's get up. We gotta keep going up. Come on, let's... Come on, Buck. Up. Come on, let's... Come on, Buck! Look at me, I said stand! Up! Up! Buck, I said up! You listen to me, Buck. When I say up... Come on. Like his up. mate, Buck was barely able to get up. But unlike them, 
he had made up his mind not to get up. He sensed disaster close at hand, out there ahead on the ice where his master was trying to drive him. This dog's finished. Give me the gun, Charles. No, Hal. Give me the damn gun. No! Finish the dog. I'll finish you. Got that? He's my dog. You mind your own business. Take him, he's nearly dead anyway. Let's go. Come on. By the time John Thornton's search had disclosed nothing more than many bruises and a state of terrible starvation, the sled was a quarter of a mile away. When John Thornton froze his feet in the previous December, his partners, Hans and Pete, had made him comfortable and left him to get well, going on themselves up the river with a boat of skins for Dawson. He was still weak at the time he rescued Buck, but with the continued warm weather, the weakness had left him. And here beside the riverbank, through the long days of approaching spring, listening lazily to the songs of birds and the hum of nature, Buck slowly won back his strength, and then, one day, decided he might trust John Thornton.
Buck romped through his convalescence and into a new existence. Love, genuine, passionate love, was his for the first time. This he had never experienced down at Judge Miller's. Theirs had been a stately and dignified friendship, but love that was feverish and burning, that was adoration, that was madness, it had taken John Thornton to arouse. This man had saved his life. For a long time after his rescue, Buck didn't let Thornton out of his sight. Since he had come into the Northland, he had feared that no master could be permanent. He was afraid that Thornton would pass out of his life, too. But in spite of this great love Buck bore John Thornton, the strain of the primitive which the Northland had aroused in him remained alive and active. Each day, mankind and the claims of mankind slipped farther from him. Deep in the forest, a call was sounding. And as often as Buck heard the call, mysteriously thrilling and luring, he felt compelled to turn his back upon the campsite and the beaten earth around it, and to plunge into the forest, and on and on. He knew not where or why. But as often as he gained the soft, unbroken earth and the dark forest shade, the love for John Thornton drew him back again. Thornton alone held him. The rest of mankind was as nothing. Convalescence was over. Along a bad stretch of rapids on the 40-mile creek, Thornton's two partners, Hans and Pete, were moving along the bank with ropes. They were getting ready to guide Thornton in the boat, which was loaded with the skins they would sell in Dawson. Don't 
Don't say hello, John. All right. I right, think with you. You strike it rich yet? No. I just look that way. Who's your friend? My partner. It's a pretty fine looking dog, mister. Hey, John. Over here. Excuse us. It looks pretty strong. You know, I got a dog can break out a sled with 500 pounds and walk right off with it. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, my boy Dugan can do the same with 600 pounds. <laughs> well, my boy Buck can do 800 pounds. <laughs> 800 pounds? And walk with it for 100 feet? And walk off with it for 100 feet. You know, I'd like to see that. I got a thousand dollars worth of gold dust that says that he can't. Stay. I got a sled waiting right outside. Okay. Thornton's dog can't meet the challenge. This deep mud? I say it ought to be three to one. I'll take those three to one odds. And I'll lay you another thousand at those odds. Any takers, come on! Got any more money? All we got. Ah, God don't triple it for us anyway. John, I'll put my money on you. or more. <laughs> I guess my 600. Done. Do this for me. Don't let me down. Your share and a hundred and fifty. Thanks for the support. When are you gonna leave? Pretty soon. Listen, why don't uh, 
You just think about it, huh? You sleep on it? Maggie. Hmm? Why do you have to give me such a hard time? <laughs> When Buck earned $1,600 in five minutes for John Thornton, he made it possible for his master to pay off certain debts and to journey into the East after a fabled lost mine, the history of which was as old as the history of the country. Many men had sought it, few had found it, and more than a few there were who had never returned from the quest. From the beginning, there had been an ancient and ramshackle cabin. Dying men had sworn to it, and to the mine which it marked, clinching their testimony with nuggets that were unlike any known grade of gold in the Northland. John Thornton asked little of man or nature. He was unafraid of the wild. With a handful of salt and a rifle, he could plunge into the wilderness and fare wherever he pleased, and as long as he pleased. This was Indian country, and being in no haste, Indian fashion, he hunted and fished for his dinner in the course of the day's travel. Lying next to Thornton, dozing lazily in the heat of the day, irresistible impulses were beginning to seize Buck. The months came and went, and at the end of all their wandering, they found not the lost cabin, but a shallow mine in a broad valley. They sought no further. still sounding in the depths of the forest. It filled Buck with a great unrest and strange desires, and he was aware of wild yearnings and stirrings for he knew not what. He pursued the call into the forest, running in the dim twilight, seeking for the mysterious something that called for him to come. Now it's time for breakfast. 
From the forest came the call. Distinct and definite as never before, a long-drawn howl, like yet unlike any noise made by a dog. And he knew it in the old familiar way as a sound heard before. Buck was wildly glad. He knew he was at last answering the call, running by the side of his wood brother toward the place from where the call surely came. He had done this thing before, somewhere in that dimly remembered world, and he was doing it again now. Buck never left camp, never let Thornton out of his sight. But after a while, his restlessness came back on him. He was a thing of the wild, come in from the wild to sit by John Thornton's fire, and he was haunted by recollections of the wild brother. Once again, he took to wandering in the woods, but the wild brother came no more. There's no gold here. We go home tomorrow. That's 
lesson well. He must be master or be mastered, while to show mercy was a weakness. Mercy did not exist in the primordial life. It was misunderstood for fear, and such misunderstandings made for death. Kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, was the law.
All day, Buck brooded by Thornton's body. Death as a succession of movement, as a passing out and away from the lives of the living, he knew. And he knew John Thornton was dead. It left a great void in him, somewhat akin to hunger, but a void which ached and ached, and which food could not fill. And with the coming of night, brooding and mourning by the river, Buck became alive to a stirring of the new life in the forest. It was the call, sounding more luring and compelling than ever before. And as never before, he was ready to obey. John Thornton was dead. The last tie was broken. Man and the claims of man no longer bound him. And here may well end the story of Buck. The years were not many when the Yeehaw Indians noted a change in the breed of timber wolves, for some were seen with splashes of brown on head and muzzle, and with a rift of gold centering down the chest. But more remarkable than this, the Yeehats tell of a ghost dog that runs with the pack. They are afraid of this ghost dog, for it has cunning greater than they, stealing from their camps in fierce winters, robbing their traps, slaying their dogs, defying their bravest hunters, and there is a certain valley which they never enter. When the long winter nights come on and the wolves follow their meat, he may be seen running at the head of the pack through the pale moonlight, leaping gigantic above his fellows, his great throat a bellow as he sings a song of the younger world, which is the song of the pack.